Hi, so I'm uh, Ezra Zuckerman Sivan. I'm uh, MIT Sloan's Associate Dean for uh, Teaching and Learning. And it is my great pleasure, pleasure and privilege to welcome you all uh, to this first session of the Ideas Made to Matter series. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to disrupt communities, industries, and economies on a global scale, it creates new challenges and uncertainty for global business leaders. And for those of us, alumni, students, staff, and faculty, it makes the, questions, the question of how we fulfill Sloan School mission to develop principled, innovative leaders who improve the world and to generate ideas that advance management practice makes this question especially urgent. With this in mind, we have invited MIT Sloan faculty members to come together to share their latest research and insights in this summer event series. We'll explore the direct implications of the global pandemic, as well as non-coronavirus topics. MIT and MIT Sloan are uniquely positioned to address the challenge of this moment across every dimension, from healthcare to finance, workplace, workplace policy to supply chain, supply chain management, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and beyond. The series will provide you with the opportunity to hear directly from faculty solving these problems in real time and to reaffirm why research at MIT Sloan matters in the world. It's now my pleasure to introduce my very good friend, Ray Reagans. Let me just do the formal introduction and then I'll be a little bit informal. So Ray Reagans is the Alfred P. Sloan Professor of Management and the newly appointed Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at MIT Sloan. Ray studies the origin and influence of social capital on knowledge transfer, learning rates, and overall team performance. More specifically, Ray examines how demographic characteristics such as race, age, and gender affect the development of network relations. He also considers how particular, how particular network structures affect performance outcomes, including the transfer of knowledge among individuals and the productivity of research and development teams. Now, before I hand it over to Ray, I gotta say, it is really a special pleasure to introduce Ray. Ray and I grew up together in a manner of speaking. Uh, we both met each other uh, about 25 years ago uh, maybe actually 26, or seven, something like that, uh, as uh, PhD students at the University of Chicago, uh, PhD students in sociology. Uh, we grew up intellectually together. We have two uh, common intellectual fathers, both co-chairs of our uh, dissertation committees, that's Ed Lauman and Ron Burt. Uh, and we grew up in a particular tradition that uh, is, um, raises really important questions, I think, for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, ones that I've had the great pleasure of working with Ray on uh, over the years. Uh, when we were growing up in what's now come, known as network science, uh, there was a very strong belief and I think expectation that the only thing that mattered were people and their relationships, and that maybe demographic characteristics uh, and that, that sometimes divide us uh, and some hopefully sometimes uh, uh, bring us together didn't matter very much. Uh, soon we began to uh, teach, uh, both of us joining uh, business schools, me first at Stanford and then and Ray at Carnegie. Uh, we began to realize that um, the real world was a little different uh, from this and to really grapple with, with these issues. And Ray in particular always took the lead on this. I had the great pleasure of co-authoring with Ray on a couple of pieces. Um, but, and, uh, and, and, but Ray is, I, I wanna emphasize uh, uh, that uh, when you hear from Ray, you are hearing uh, deep insights about um, a bunch of related issues, uh, including uh, uh, some things that you probably won't emphasize as much today, organizational learning, uh, but certainly in diversity uh, and inclusion, which we'll, which we'll talk about, I think, as well. Um, and there's a, there's a certain clarity of insight that you get from Ray that you certainly can't get uh, from anyone else. I've seen this, and one of the great pleasures I've had is I got to Sloan a little before Ray did, and so I had the, 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 um, the, there's nothing like being a close friend with someone and being able to introduce him to others in a community that you care so much about. 
and have them be excited about him joining the community and what he can bring to the community. I've had that pleasure in a bunch of different uh, times, uh, in different stages of, of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of sort of membership at, at Sloan. And each time it's leading with the uh, deep insight in, in those ideas, ideas that are very abstract at some level and very general, but also very concrete and very uh, personally meaningful. Uh, some of that comes from uh, Ray's ability just to um, draw people into his experience um, in different parts of his life, uh, including in his um, neighborhood in Pittsburgh. I'll let you let him tell you about that. Um, if we don't, we might get back to it uh, later. I want to emphasize. Um, I will. So there will be opportunity for for um, fielding of questions and, um, uh, after Ray's presentation. I will be monitoring those questions, and I'm going to um, try to um, bring them together. And I want to thank uh, Lauren and Patsy for everything in in, in orga organizing that, including our ability to make that Q and A possible. So uh, without any further ado, I give you Ray Reagans. Thank, thank you, Ezra. Um, fortunately for me, I'm having some internet trouble on this end, so I didn't get to hear all of your kind words. I won't feel much pressure uh, to live up to them. You've kind of thrown me a little bit, but I'll, I'll share this. I often tell people that when I joined MIT, you know, I joined MIT for uh, two reasons. Uh, one, to be around more sociologists. Two, to be in particular around Ezra Zuckerman and Roberto Fernandez. Uh, these were people that although I was at Carnegie, I worked with them quite frequently. So is, I need to know if you folks can hear me because the screen looks frozen on my end. I can hear you, Ray. Fantastic. So I, I think this is a, a, a wonderful forum for talking about uh, some of my early research. And it is because our advisor, one of our joint advisors, was presenting some of his work to alums of the University of Chicago. And after the presentation, someone in HR, or I just assume this person was in HR, came up to our advisor with a problem. And he said to Ron, he said, Ron, I have this interesting challenge I'm dealing with, and I'd like to get your advice. And the challenge was when this individual looked at the peer reviews among people of color in a financial services firm, those peer reviews were significantly more positive than the peer reviews other people in the organization gave each other. And so the question for Ron was, how do I reliably adjust those peer reviews down? So that was the presenting question. And so um, our advisor said to this gentleman, I'm not quite sure that you want to adjust them down. I'd like to introduce you to one of my graduate students who's doing, I think, some interesting research on this topic. And so this is in the spirit that I thought I heard Ezra describing of my project. My project at the time was describing how people who were similar to each other, how they way they interacted with each other varied as a function of the number of people like them in a situation. Abstract as I, one of the herds I, I heard as were used. But it turned out that this very basic idea was useful for the manager. And here's the idea, I hope in a less abstract way. Imagine that you work in a job and imagine that I'm able to keep track of the number of people who share a demographic characteristic with you. So if you're a senior manager in a firm, I can measure the number of, for me, it would be the number of African-American senior managers in the firm. In particular, the proportion of African-American senior managers in a firm or in a job, it doesn't really matter. And I'm gonna ask this question. I'm gonna ask, how does the relationship between African-Americans vary as a function of their representation as they go from a small number to a relatively larger number. And the basic idea was, let's assume that there's some basic level of interpersonal attraction that two African-Americans have for each other. It's constant across the situation and it's just some small positive affect. 
But now let's imagine that there are two other pieces to this puzzle. And the first piece is, what if there's a closeness bonus? Meaning there's a bonus that I give to people like me when I feel like they enhance my setting in the situation, when they enhance my standing in the situation. And if I'm part of a numerical minority, you can imagine that people worry, they wonder if I belong. And so when I'm part of a numerical minority, this closeness bonus is high. But as our numbers increase, the magnitude of that bonus goes down. And then here comes the, that's the social psychology that managed to survive the University of Chicago. The next idea focuses in on competition. But what if two people who share an attribute also compete against each other for attention in the organization? Not an unreasonable assumption for a sociologist. We think of crowding and these kinds of peer effects all the time. And what if that closeness penalty increases as representation increases? And so then it turns out you have these three little pieces that add up to describe how people who share an attribute will interact with each other. When we're part of a numerical minority, when our numbers are small, that closeness bonus will be the largest piece of the puzzle. As our numbers grow, that bonus goes down and this negative effect starts to take over. And so the magnitude of this positive effect that people who share an attribute have for each other, it begins to decline. And eventually, it has the potential to turn negative. And so we shared these results. The, the, the manager gave us the data. We estimated this very basic, I'll use the term density dependence model on his peer review data. And what we found was not surprising to us, but perhaps surprising to him. And so the first piece was when women, African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, they were all in the less than 15 to 5% range. And the peer reviews that they gave each other were in fact significantly more positive. Out to the right, we had men and white members of the population. They represented usually more than 75 to 80% of the population. Turns out that sharing those attributes didn't matter at all. And this became a question that we used for him to pull him into our analysis even more. And so we showed him that as he expected, that the women and people of color did in fact give each other more positive reviews. But then we said, we'd like for, we put additional data up and we said, there's something that you didn't notice that we'd like to share with you. And it is this, that when people are much younger or much older than the people in their job, they also give each other more positive evaluations. The same bias that we saw for race and gender, we could recover for age. People who are either much older or much younger. And it turns out that those individuals tended to be white men. And so our first point, to, there are actually two points. The first one was what you've observed is actually a function of the situation in which these people are working. The context in which they're working shapes how they interact with each other. And that's true for people of color. And it was also true for the white men in his organization. And then there was another piece that we showed him, and it was what happens when the numbers get really big or relatively big. In that situation, these peer reviews were systematically more negative. Again, this wasn't something that he noticed because he was simply focusing on the more visible characteristics. The surprising piece for us, and it wasn't that surprising once we thought about it, was the fact that when people were part of a much larger majority, there was no effect that sharing an attribute had on their peer reviews. It was as if the attribute didn't matter because when we're all the same, we need to look for something else to make us different. And in this organization for the white men, it turned out it was age. And so once we shared these results with him, he said, well, what should I do? And I hate to call it a tongue in cheek, but it, it was at that point in my life, well, if you want this bias to 
to go down for women and people of color, you should hire more of them. But the point I would make to him now, if I had another chance to have that conversation would be, these curves that I'm describing to you, describe what's normal. And so I'm reminded of the time when people say, why are all the African-Americans sitting together at the lunchroom table? Well, with this kind of framework, that now makes sense. And you also start to look for other groups that are similar that might also be sitting together at the lunchroom table because when we're part of a numerical minority, it's just natural for us to seek out the company of people who enhance our standing in that situation. And so that was the first paper. Actually, it wasn't the first paper. First paper, uh, Ezra and I have violated the basic premise of that paper. The first paper was a master's paper that described the instability of interracial ties. Um, but we've known each other for more than 26 years, so I, I'm wrong on that one. So I decided not to discuss it in any detail. The next paper, I should mention to you, why am I discussing this research? So in my new role as the Associate uh, Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, you know, Fiona Murray and I have been tasked with addressing many of these challenges. And, and there's a reason that we said yes. And one of those reasons that we said yes is, number one, both of us do research on these topics. We saw these new assignments as an opportunity to apply what we knew. And in fact, what we had dedicated a significant part of our research careers to doing. But there's another reason why we said yes. It's the fact that we have a number of colleagues who are also doing research on these important topics. And so the decisions that we're making in our new roles are guided by our research, and they're also guided by the research of other members of our community. And, and we find comfort in that fact. And so the second project I'll share with you is actually a project that I have with Ezra. And I'm forgetting the exact year. I don't wanna give away the year actually, but I remember sitting in my office at Carnegie Mellon. I was on the phone with you, Ezra, and you were in your office in, in Palo Alto. And we were both being asked to teach a class or a session in our class on diversity. And very much like some of our faculty now who are being asked to teach a class on diversity, we were uncomfortable with that fact. And so we said, well, there's a way for us to feel more comfortable and that would be for us to simply do some research on the topic. If we do research on the topic, we be, we become more of an expert in the area and it gives you, um, a foundation for speaking with authority. And so we decided we would focus in on how the demographic diversity of a team affected the team's performance. And we thought this would be a really interesting thing to study, in particular if we were to add a network lens to it. Well, the challenge was, as we started to read this research, let's just say it was a jungle. When we looked at the research on the link between demographic diversity and team performance, some articles would say, ah, diversity has a positive effect. We could find articles that would say diversity has a negative effect. We could find articles that say diversity will not have an effect at all. And when you looked at the empirical evidence, it looked exactly like that. Sometimes the effect for diversity was positive, Sometimes it was negative and sometimes it was no effect at all. And so what were we going to do? And so we begin to think about it. Why did diversity matter? Instead of focusing in on diversity, we begin to ask ourselves, well, why would diversity affect team performance? And we were able to imagine two ways, or two prototypical ways diversity would affect team performance. And the first one was, well, diversity should affect how members of a team interact with each other. If people feel more comfortable with people who are like them, adding diversity to a team has the potential to fragment relationships inside the team. 
So that's one step. But diversity also has another effect on a team, and it is the kinds of networks that people have outside the team. When people are different from each other, they probably travel in different networks outside the organization and even in different parts of the organization. They will have different networks. And so adding more demographic diversity to a team, while it has the potential to fragment relationships inside the team, it also has the potential to make the relationships that team members have with people outside the team broader and more expansive. And these two network variables, one of them which is about how expansive the team's network is, and the other one which is about how cohesive the, team, the team's network is, both of those can have their own effects on team performance. In fact, both of them should have a positive effect on team performance. And so what we developed was this very, I thought, simple framework that described the pathways through which diversity could affect team performance. And it was through these two network variables. One of them we called internal cohesion and the other one we called external range. Diversity has a negative effect on internal cohesion. It has a positive effect on internal range. And each one of those network variables had a positive effect on team performance. And so we had a framework. Next, we had data. And so we estimated this very basic equation and the effects look exactly as we imagined. So in addition to shedding some light on how diversity could affect performance, it also, this project also shed some light on how different kinds of social capital could complement each other. Because when we were children, and I think we were children, at the University of Chicago, there was this basic idea that these two network forms of internal co of cohesion and range were in conflict with each other. And Ezra and I found a situation where that wasn't true. We found a situation where these two network forms of social capital could actually complement each other. It was good evidence for our argument, but it wasn't perfect evidence for our argument. And our next project in this space we found better network data. We found better performance data. We found a way to control for the unobserved differences between members of the team. If, if, if I'm, when I'm talking to my students, I like to say there is literally no comparison between our second paper and our first paper. And yet that first paper I think has something like three times more citation counts than the second paper. So you only get one bite at the apple, I guess is the, the moral of that story. So how would a manager use these ideas? And this is where I heard Ezra saying we took a very general approach to these problems. If you listen to that solution, it suggested that the solution was not to focus too closely on demographic diversity by focusing in on diversity, a manager introduced a trade-off between these two intervening processes that also mattered. And so the lesson for that paper was, don't focus on diversity, focus on the network variables. Staff a team using what you know about how people are connected to each other. That would allow you to realize the benefits of both kinds of social capital. But what about diversity? It turns out if you staff a team based on how people are connected to individuals outside the team, women and people of color tend to in fact have more expansive networks when women and people of color are spread out around the organization. The desire for them to interact with people who are like them necessarily leads to a more expansive network. That wasn't for me, sorry, Lauren, I saw that go up. All right, so that's our lessons. And I, I think this is a very, so the first paper was much more of what's normal? Uh, what can you expect? These, act, the ideas around diversity and team performance are much more actionable, especially with the kind of data we have on how people are connected to each other inside of organizations. 
you could literally build an algorithm to staff teams using these ideas. The third project I'll share with you in many respects is um, not what you would expect from a University of Chicago sociologist. I'm a structuralist um, in the way I think. The proportion of people who like me are like me in an organization, that's a structural variable. Diversity, again, a structural variable. Networks, structural variables that affect how people interact with each other and that affect performance. The third project that I'm gonna describe with you uh, breaks that mold because it focuses in on culture. And it asks the question, well, how does culture affect the performance of women and people of color? And so when I, start, I started this project with Evan Applebaum and Nicole Stevens. And um, Evan, it's funny, these, many of these things emerge from teaching. Evan and I were teaching the core OP class together. And so we spent most of our time uh, chatting, talking, uh, thinking about the material that we were gonna present. But we both also had an interest in diversity. And so one day, uh, Evan came to me and he had this uh, data set where he needed to adjust uh, for a dynamic in the data. What he needed to adjust for is not important. And he asked me if, if I would uh, do it for him. And I said, of course. And I said, I have this experiment that I'm trying to design. Would you help me design the experiment? And so we said, deal. Well, nothing happened with my experiment because it turns out when I started working with him on adjusting uh, this dynamic in his project, the project was just fascinating. Evan and Nicole had collected this data, website data from law firms. And they were, they saw this website data as a cultural art artifact. The information that firms broadcast about themselves tell members of the organization and people outside the organization what's important. And so they were looking for ways to code that data for an indicator of culture. And so this is where I step in. And so what we did was, we did exactly that. We used not the latest because this was earlier in time, you know, natural language processing to basically code these web pages for law firms in terms of the kind of diversity culture that they represented. And it turned out that two ways of thinking about diversity could be found on these web pages. And one of them just talked about the value of equality. You should come to the, to the MIT Sloan School because we have equal processes. We have, everyone will be treated fairly and equally. And the only thing that matters is the quality of your idea. That's a value and equality way of talking about diversity. There were other firms that talked about diversity in a different way. You should come to the MIT Sloan School because what you have to say as an African-American is valuable and it adds value to our discussion. This was a way of talking about diversity where people with their different backgrounds and experiences had distinct perspectives that made all of us better. I, I, I love that we're smart enough to know that we're smarter together. And that's what this is. That's the idea. And so it turns out there were two kinds of cultures that we found. And the question was, at least initially, well, which one would matter? And so as we began to, to estimate these models, we discovered this really interesting contingency that I have to admit to suspecting. And you'll know why, you'll see why I suspected it in a minute. We found that African-Americans found the value and equality culture more rewarding than the value and diversity culture, while women found the value and diversity culture more rewarding than African-Americans. And by rewarding, we were able to measure their performance. We were able to measure the likelihood of them turning over. African-Americans did better in a value and equality culture, and they were less likely to turn over. 
where women did better in a value and diversity culture, sorry, a value and difference culture, and they were less likely to turn over. And then we said, well, why? And this is where my suspicion shows up. It turns out that it wasn't about being an African-American or being a woman. It was about being part of a numerical minority. That when women, and by this we, had to, we took people into the labs to run these experiments and we could manipulate the perceived level of perception of uh, representation in an organization. And when I was, saw myself as being part of a numerical minority, woman or person of color, a small minority, five to 10%, the value and equality culture was more appealing to me. As that number increased, when we made people think they were part of a much larger group of people in the firm, they began to value the value and difference culture more. And so we saw it for race and gender, but it turns out that the driving variable was our representation in the organization. And again, this makes sense. When I'm part of a small minority in the firm, I worry about my membership. And so a firm that says you belong is simply more appealing to me. But when I'm much larger in my representation, I'm no longer worried about membership. I'm asking myself, how do I add value here? And a firm that tells me you add value through your unique experiences, now that firm becomes more rewarding for me, a more appealing for me. I could tell you the next wave of this research, but I suspect that's best left for the time that Ezra and I are about to spend together. Is that correct, Ezra? Uh, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. Yes, I have to find my... Uh... Ray, that was fantastic. Uh, yeah, so let's let's have that. I see a couple of questions in a Q&A that I want to- I, I didn't say weaker. I didn't say weaker. It's not weaker. a weaker paper. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we talk amongst ourselves, right? <laughs> uh, the, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's an interesting issue. We can get into it in-, in uh, It's not. Well, so let me, let me say a few things. So one is I do want to toss you that softball question, which is what's next, Ray? What? And tell me about how-, how uh, you know, you're going to build on this past. But let me ask you a few tougher questions first. Sure. Tough so, questions first. Uh, I, I should say, so um, uh, thrilled that you and Fiona took on uh, really important uh, uh, roles as associates, associate deans of, of, uh, of diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I, um, for uh, among the many, many reasons why it's, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, a huge service to the school, and we're lucky to have you being able to play that role, is the fact that um, I was um, co-chair of a task force on diversity and uh, inclusion this past fall. Uh, it was a fantastic experience with students and alums, and I know you've been engaging with a lot of students uh, and, and alums during this process too. And I found myself referring to the paper that you just described with uh, Evan and uh, Nicole Stevens, just again and again and again, as you know, because people kept on then mentioning to you. Um, so I think it's, it's just profound. One thing I want to make sure, so on a couple things in what you said, I want to just um, make sure that people appreciate as much as they should um, and how much they challenge us uh, in various ways, right? So I think, you know, this is intellectually challenging, but also sort of practically challenging right? because there just there really are no easy solutions uh, for this. And I think, uh, so, one way I wanted to um, I want to mention a couple of things. So one is right. Um, so there's this deep insight, right, which is that um, you can you know uh, you get this different perspective, different orientation to the question of what a a, a uh, what a firm, an organization's diversity and inclusion policy should be, right? depending on what demographic group you're in. And then, it, and, but then it really de depends on, um, but anyone could be in that position, right? Anyone could, could want that depending on your relative proportions. Notice how Ray was waiting to see whether I would get this right or not, right? Do I really get it? <laughs> After all these years, you still don't even trust me. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm just, you've pointed out an issue, a very important issue. Right. Right. So from a practical perspective. You and I are going to want different things. Right. right. Organization. 
I think that, right. And so, you know, we face this at Sloan and, and I think any organization faces this, which is, let's say you're trying to craft a, a policy and you've got just inevitably, how could you not have um, different groups with different proportions in, the org in, in an organization? And given the fact that they're going to want, a, you know, essentially uh, be more inclined, be more receptive to a particular policy, you know, basically a value of inequality versus value uh, indifference. How do you square those things? Right? Is there, is there a way to at least make progress in squaring those things? Clearly, it seems to imply don't assume that there's one right answer to this question. But what is a practical person or practical uh, leader to do, given the fact that, that uh, you've got multiple groups like this, each one is, is going to sort of um, be more receptive or respond more positively to a different kind of policy. Was that the softball question? No, that was not the softball question. Okay. <laughs> I was, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the structural solution is there's a range of values of representation where the groups will, so, so organizational management, make sure they're at the same level of representation. This is unrealistic. An another response is, um, but there's a range of values along representation where they would find the same culture um, appealing. That also doesn't feel very satisfying. <laughs> find the middle ground, in other words. Find the middle ground where they, there's, you know, they, they would both find it appealing. Uh, well, I have to go to the next project because this worried me. In fact, it worried me. I didn't want to, I didn't, <laughs> we should publish the paper with that as the message. Right. I thought we needed another study. And this was the study. And I'm working on it now with, with James Melody. When you look at research on representation. J James, by the way, is a Stone doctoral student. Is a, is a, is a, a, who studies culture. So. He's my culture expert. How do I, if you go back to that first paper that I described to you, the dissertation paper, it was about how representation affected, you know, to what extent that I like people who were similar to me versus if I didn't. And it turns out that the issue there, and it took me a while to, to really appreciate this is, what is it like to be part of a numerical minority? When I'm part of a numerical minority, I stand out as an individual. People notice me. I'm simply more visible. The funny thing is <laughs> they're actually less likely to know, they know less about me as an individual, although I stand out more. This becomes the issue. But as our numbers grow, I'm no longer, quote, over-individuated. I'm under-individuated where everyone is like me, I need to stand out in some way. And so this becomes the real underlying mechanism to all of this, is that when I'm over-individuated, right, I worry about my membership in an organization, which in fact should make the value and equality culture more appealing to me. When I'm under-individuated, I worry about what I have to offer which should make the value and difference culture more appealing to me. And so James and I have run, we manipulated those two conditions. We've run these studies and it's true. It's true for white men, it's true for white women, it's true for African-American women um, uh, as an empiricist, uh, a, 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 you know, a special place in my heart. They always seem to line up with the theory special festival place. Maybe that's not a good thing to say. So we're able to show if we can create a culture where we manipulate those conditions, now one culture becomes more appealing. All right, the world is never that clean. So it turns out that for African American men, when we prime them to be over individuated, they really like a value and equality culture. They really excel. When we prime them to think of themselves as a member of a group, there's actually no difference between the two cultures. 
but at least you don't pay a cost. For women, when we prime them to think about themselves as a member of a group, they really excel in the value and um, difference condition. When we prime them to think about themselves as individuals, you don't see a difference between the conditions. So then there, at least you don't pay a cost. And so I'm much more comfortable with this set of ideas because in fact, they're much more grounded in my original thinking about this question. And then their implications, I think, are also cleaner. That you won't always get the upside, but you at least will not pay the cost. And so hopefully there's no one out there who's thinking about doing any mechanical Turk work anytime soon because we're about to launch a new study which tries to, dis to tease apart the mechanisms, right? So we have nice data on the experimental conditions to outcomes. The next step is what are the mechanisms that are responsible? Kind of like the network variables in our team paper. What are the mechanisms between the experimental condition and the outcome that we care about? Very, very interesting, Ray. Uh, so I want to ask one other question before it, and I, I want to uh, collect a little bit of questions in, in the, in the Q&A. So I, I want to reinforce something about the, let me ask two related questions about the first paper and then how you brought it back into the, uh, into this. Uh, one thing is just, I think it's worth emphasizing the generality of the idea, right? So uh, I think most people don't connect say market competition and complementarities across say firms in an industry, often in the concept of say of, of entrepreneurial startups with the kinds of questions that you're analyzing. But when you use the word density dependence to talk about that, so just, just you know, to have in mind, right, that that's a, there's a, a very general idea here. So just as two new and well, great paradox about entrepreneurial startups, right, is that there's actually some benefit of entering together under say a new label of what that you know uh, the problem you're all trying to solve uh and it's the same kind of like banding together you're talking about in a uh, high school cafeteria yes. right and then and then as they grow up the competitive effects start to become the the individuating effect right? so just to emphasize like that that uh you know that the other point i want to i, I want to ask about though and that's our baseline that, so that's right that's our i mean you made reference to that i mean that's how we were trained to think about the world. So we're inclined to see those kinds of dynamics. Right. Fair enough, fair enough. I guess my question is gonna be, and then one of the things that was cool about you describing in the initial paper was, you know, it's not just race, it's not just gender. It can be, um, you know, white men have this too, and maybe it's different parts of the age distribution, right? Whether you're very young or very old. Um, and I'm thinking now, uh, so let's plug a little bit our close friend and colleague, Catherine Turco's work on tokenism. Can I plug someone else first? Sure. Damon. So I am rarely which, able which, to- Which Damon? We, we're Phillips, from, I'm sorry. Damon, Damon Phillips of Columbia, yep. I'm rarely able to teach that research in class. It just never goes well for me. Damon, on the other hand, he said, man, that's, thank you. That's some of the easiest stuff I've ever been given. He said, you don't get them to think about race first. I do it with just lawyers with different specialties first. Right. And I get them to think through the logic and they all say, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Then I share with them that this was something that you developed the long race. Interesting. So you anticipated where I'm going, right? Which is in part, well, so I think part of, so this is a, a great um, paper published by Catherine Turco about the private equity industry. Yes. Right. And, part, and when she does, there's actually contrast a little bit, the experience of, of women, and they're typically white women and, and African-Americans, typically African men in this case, right? And with some sense that actually the, um, so images in an industry of the, of the ideal worker. Yes. Right? Vary, uh, and in a macho industry, actually, you know, it's it maybe more disadvantageous to be a woman, at least in the, in the period she was studying, right? Um, but more generally, like, so, and this goes, I think, to what you're describing about the, the work right now with James, right, which is sort of the way that, so there's, numbers takes you so far, uh, to a certain extent, right, but then there seem to be societal and maybe industry-specific um, ideas that are out there that are harder to, to move, at least within some particular time frame, and so I'm curious how you think about that. 
So yes, so it's funny, we saw, Evan and Nicole and I thought of culture as the, as the solution for demography, in the, in the sense of what you're describing. Demography represents, creates certain kind of challenges and culture can introduce its own kind of solution. It wasn't until I really started to think about this and, and I told Kat this, so um, I'm happy to say it now. She got there first. <laughs> Demographic characteristics create their own set of challenges and the culture can either solve it or exacerbate it. That, that's what her, in my mind, that's what her paper illustrates very nicely. But she's showing the positive and negative side. And then she focuses it on it at the level of an individual. So there wasn't much so much about representation, it was about the characteristic itself. But I told her this, I said, you know, Kat, as I thought of new work more, you got there first. And so for you folks out there in the audience who are listening, for an academic to tell another academic, you got there first, it's unheard of. <laughs> so, so Ray, let me, take, let me look at a couple of questions uh, in the Q and A. Um, look, there's one very general one that sort of integrates what you're saying with um, your work uh, in practice right now, uh, on diversity, uh, equity, inclusion. So the question is, what are your best insights? <laughs> or maybe you just give like one uh, that um, on equitable selection and promotion processes and how we correct for underrepresentation well without creating negative effects in other ways. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the, the, this is an anonymous question. You know, one, one can wonder what those anonymous effects they have in mind, um, but, you know, I guess you can run with that question as you see fit. Yeah. That's, that's so this is the reason why we, uh, why we wrote that teams and diversity paper. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reluctant to answer that question without a, without a little bit more experience, without actually knowing how this works. Short answer is we're gonna run experiments and we'll know how it works. Hmm. And I'm happy to report back the results of those experiments. This is, we plan on uh, doing orientation, uh, presenting some material, around bias, implicit bias in, in particular. And as we discuss it, a thing that I think is important, and I got this from Roberto, Roberto Fernandez really helped me with this, is, Ray, you understand that there's, 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 there's um, blowback building up in the system, right? And we have to be prepared for that. I don't have an answer, I don't have a good answer to that question, I wouldn't venture a guess. So I'm not punting. I'm saying I want to answer that question. And when I have an answer, how about wow, we got to find a way to register this question? How would we get the answer back out? A better. So there's a question here, by the way, Ray, they want you to create, um, this is a request for you to create a LinkedIn page or a good place where you can follow your ideas and new publishing. But uh, I, I assume there's, is there, there's a page for the DI. Exactly what I was going to say. Right. So. Um, as much as we enjoyed reading uh, the uh, task force report and the executive summary, the goal that Fiona and I have is not to write one. We want the web page to be the place where people can go to see what we're thinking about doing and what we're currently doing. And so Kate and her team totally redesigned the web page for us, and that's how we're using it now. So Kato the answer Sullivan to that question will be on the web page. I'm sorry, say again? I'm just saying Cato Sullivan, the uh, Cato Sullivan. director of the Office of Communication. And so, we've, and so we've learned a great deal about these issues from our, our I would say our current colleague, Rick Locke at Brown. Um, and one thing I loved about what Rick does is that they have a forum where Rick and his team, they get presented with a set of issues and they have a certain amount of time before they have to respond to those questions in a public forum, right? And it's, it's the community participates in these efforts together. We're trying to create something similar to that on the web page. We haven't gotten there yet. So Ray, uh, got it. Um, I wanted to ask you questions from the early one of the earlier questions about the Teams paper. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, 
why would diversity have systematically a negative impact on internal cohesion? Uh, it says here, some people are looking for diversity um, because they, they find their different thinking, refreshing, insightful, resourceful. And I like this last, no, this is, um, I'm not sure I'm gonna pronounce the name correctly, forgive me, um, from uh, Americ uh, Le Boulanger. Uh, personally, I would like, I would dislike a copy of myself. <laughs> who wants to work with clones when you can work with people who are interestingly uh, and productively different from yourself is a version of the question. So yeah, why do we assume that in the first instance? It's a good so I'm not sure we assume it, we show it. There's a difference, <laughs> right? I yeah. Mean, I, I'm, um, when I'm at my best self, I, I like myself as examples. When I'm my best self, I love it when I'm around people who are interesting and different from me. But when I'm not at my best self and those people disagree with me and might appear to have ideas that are better than mine, I'm not always sure that that's gonna to lead to a productive interaction. And I think that's most of us. That there are in fact times when we find that appealing but some part of us needs to be affirmed. And we're more likely to be affirmed by people who are like us. I love that answer. Um, I wanna say, I wanna notice something and tell me if you agree, right? Which is, and it goes back to a question that one could ask. I don't know if people would appreciate how much pushback um, you got and get um, certainly early on for the idea that our tendency to gravitate uh, towards others like ourselves, which sociologists and social psychologists some call, sometimes call homophily, sort of love of self, something like that, right? Birds of a feather flock together. And so I think a really important theme that's worth emphasizing is in, in Ray's work, right, is that that love of self is not something to be taken for granted, that it depends, right? On, and sometimes it goes the other direction, right? But, or at least it's, there's limits to it and it sort of depends on context, right? But it's interesting, right? Because I think that the questioner is noticing attention, right? Which is, in general, that is the case, and why it's and we see it empirically, it is the case, which is why we show enough work. But uh, it depends on context, and there are times in which it may make sense for us to try to limit it, right? Um, so the questioner actually is somewhere that we would the, the community that we're trying to create, where everyone feels affirmed already. Mm. And now they can move on to enjoying the ideas that are different from the ideas that they have. But when that's not true, when everyone doesn't feel affirmed, when there's some issue around my standing, we're going to find comfort in people who agree with us. So Ray, here's a great question. I think can also link to other research that you've done. Um, I'm guessing, I think, you know, especially uh, um, on self-monitoring perhaps. Uh, and so there's a question here, which is um, have Ray or Ezra, the answer is not Ezra. Uh, done any research on diversity of personality and how that aligns with race, gender, and other elements of social identity. Um, someone, and here's someone saying this is poignant and I think important. I was recently called, quote, abrasive and told to be, uh, sum, quote, submissive at work for being opinionated and confident, also in quotes, about racial equity at work. So there's a lot in there, but I'm curious um, how, how you think this relates to sort of Personality, this is also about, you know, maybe biased attributions of personality. It's more, it's a lot in there. It is a lot in there. Um, there's a, um, there's lots of work on uh, personality and networks. It's in some ways like the link between diversity and performance. The effects are mixed. But there's one personality characteristic where the, the effects are pretty consistent and robust. And it's the personality characteristic called self-monitoring. Um, I like, so some people self-monitors self, self are chameleons. I like to say that self-monitors are social pragmatists in the sense that they're really good at reading a situation and figuring out what's the appropriate way to respond or interact. And it turns out that it's the self-monitors that are much more likely to have expansive networks, right? And you can also imagine that these are the individuals who are much more comfortable 
uh, with difference. Frank Flynn and I have actually have papers on this and I'll share one of them, not because it has any managerial implication, but because it illustrates the effect of personality very nicely. And what Frank and I were interested in, because he's a psychologist and I'm a sociologist and Ezra and I have this variable called network closure and Frank in his world has a, a variable called need for closure, which is, you know, social psychological construct, personality characteristic. And Frank and I were like, wouldn't it be neat if we just wrote a paper that had those two, two terms in the title? This is what academics are allowed to do. And it turns out there's this really interesting effect. And here's one way we got at it. That when people have a high need for closure, things have to make sense to them. People who have a low need for structure, a um, need for closure, things that appear to be in conflict with each other, that's okay. And so what we did was we showed these people different kinds of networks, you know, networks were friends of friends were friends where there was clear structure in the network and people with the high need for closure. Of course, they were able to learn that quickly, but what happens when you put in misinformation where friends of friends were not friends. Now they struggled. Now people with the low need for closure did better. Study one, study two, show them a network. Actually, no information in the network. I know we're running out of time. No information in this network, but it's people of color. And we say, we'll give you a chance to win an iPhone if you can tell us how these people are connected to each other. There is no information on how they're connected. People with a high need for closure impose a network on it. The people with the low need for closure, they would literally say to us, what are you talking about? You haven't given me enough information to solve this problem. And so there's a way that personality also matters. People with a high need for closure, they tend to think that people who are like each other know each other. They tend to think that friends of friends are friends, that they live in a much more structured world. The gray world is simply harder for them to see. Uh, we could go on and on and on. I certainly would love to, as you know. Uh, but we do have to close this out. I'm so, so glad, Ray, that you did this. Uh, I know, as you can tell from the questions, and I just, uh, you know, more generally, uh, can feel somehow through Zoom the real great appreciation um, for what you shared today. Uh, I want to I close um, uh, by, by thanking you and also Lauren and Patsy, putting this together, and the Office of External Relations, led by Kathy Fox. I want to put in two plugs. So one is for the next uh, one of these series. This will be a conversation with Roberto Rigobon in one week on July 22nd, same time. I also want to put a plug in that there's going to be a um, DEI, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Town Hall, uh, led by Ray and Fiona Murray. This will be on July 30th at noon and look for um, information about, about that. So, uh, a good opportunity also to wish everyone well. It is challenging times out there. Um, it's great to be able to connect uh, with you in this way. And we look forward to additional ways to in, in, in this series and beyond to connect the MIT Sloan community. Take care. Uh, no, no, don't leave yet. Uh, I, one reason I was willing to say yes to taking this job is because my good friend Ezra Zuckerman had already improved the Sloan community on these dimensions over the last five years. This is important that it's said, thank you, Ezra. I think you've made this a much, I can't say easy, but you've made this an easier assignment. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> take, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.